Marilyn, for this wonderful opportunity to have us here today and speak to you all about the Canadian History Project. I'm going to go quickly through the outreach uh, section. I want people to know and understand um, what it's been like to have uh, this public history platform through social media, uh, what it's done for the project, but also what it's done in translating this idea of a space to talk about history, having this be in a more interesting way than just as an academic setting or just for archivists or researchers or people, uh, scholars. So um, to begin, uh, last uh, August I approached Chris about creating a Facebook page. Um, I told him there were three key points that needed uh, to be said about creating the page and one was to identify the public we were reaching out to uh, and to inform the followers that were interested in our archive on what we're doing in terms of our initiative. Um, I said that the layout of a Facebook page would allow us to tell a story. Um, as you can tell, if you all have Facebook, I'm assuming, or the majority of you have Facebook. It's that concept of a timeline. You're telling a story, you have an album section, uh, you have the about section as well. And finally, um, I told Chris what it would also do, it would allow us uh, to engage the public by creating a platform um, that would, they could learn about Greek immigration to Canada in hopefully fun and interesting ways. Um, it allows for history to be learned beyond the walls of the traditional classroom uh, using modern technology, especially social media. Uh, so the internet platform is in this way uh, a digital accessible translation of the work of history. Um, another point I'd also like to add uh, that Chris, you know, touches upon um, people's works being in their basement, um, people not knowing that they can put this material somewhere. At the end of the day, when someone does pass, it's the family that becomes, you know, the, the holders of this material and they are the generation that's in this room that is of mine and Chris's generation, uh, where they get to keep this material or it's passed down to them uh, by means of what's left in the houses, and if they don't know where they can put this, then who are we reaching out to at the end as well? Um, so this is the Facebook page, quickly. Uh, this is how we first uh, started off. So the building of the Facebook page, as I mentioned, you have your about section, general description, mission as well, uh, photos, um, reviews, and much more, so notes, events, and so on. And of course, our initial uh, promotional material when we first went public on September 1st. Uh, we used it at first as a way to be promoting the archive, but then we realized we needed to use uh, social media in a more um, constructive way for the archive. Uh, before we could do that, we had to think about what is Facebook going to do for us as an archive, and that refers to the Insights page. Um, my, many of you have actually not seen this type of feature on Facebook unless you have a Facebook page. So just a little bit about insights. Um, for Facebook users, it tells us the activity that's going on on your page. So it allows us to understand um, if someone, if we've grown in terms of public awareness, um, the organizations that are following us, how many people are following us, how far did this post get to our followers or the general public that lands on your page, um, the type of engagement you've had, if it's a high amount compared to another type of post, that also allows you uh, insight and ideas into how to get to that level again with your next post. So what was it that your public was interested in and aware of? Uh, so Chris and I started to see what type of appeal our audience had, um, what, was, what were they interested in enough. Um, interestingly enough, this page has also expanded to a lot of followers outside of Canada, many of them being in Greece right now. Uh, so this brings back to Saki's uh, point on Greeks, not just the diaspora Greeks not having their history being told, but the history is not being told and learned here in Greece about other Greeks abroad. So this is a way for them to also connect and learn, and we've noticed that through the um, increase of Greek interest about Greek Canadians in Greece. So um, one of the things we decided to do um, in the beginning is we decided to showcase uh, the publicity um, the project had received with articles that mentioned or featured the Great Canadian History Project. Uh, but slowly we decided we needed to start creating an engagement on our page. And this is where the online public history space and the showcase of memory and experience of Canada's 
Greek immigrants and their descendants um, started. And it started with a little project that Chris and I decided to call um, then and now uh, the October Ohi Parade in Toronto on the, on the Greek town, Danforth. Uh, we have a Paralasi every year uh, to commemorate Ikostio Toyek Tombriu and uh, also in March Ikostipenti Martiu. And for the October parade, uh, we decided to have this uh, showcase of photos um, that trace the evolution of Toronto's Greek town through a photo submission of past Ohi pictures, uh, parade pictures from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, which were then juxtap uh, juxtaposed uh, with photos taken in the October 2013 um, Ohi photos. And this is an example of one of them. And this is where we started to notice uh, engagement. Uh, people started uh, commenting on it, they started liking it, they started sharing it. Uh, one or two said, oh, I remember that year, it was very cold, or uh, oh, I remember I used to march with this uh, association. <coughs> uh, very few points and comments that started to have people become involved in that history, become involved in that memory. Um, and then of course uh, one great feature we had on um, there is um, one of the oldest uh, pictures that we've come across, dated uh, October 28th, 1978, um, from the Kefalunia Ithaki Association of uh, Toronto. So then um, we decided, hey, this worked well in October, let's start doing something called theme posts. So what we meant by this is we were finding uh, material artifacts that would appeal to uh, particular events in history that captured the Greek immigrant experience. So for the month of November, we decided uh, to mark Remembrance Day um, with a post. Uh, having a theme post, however, we realized that aside from the fact that this post, it did receive 113 shares um, and just over 55 likes. So it was quite popular that allowed people to identify with their Greek identity and their Canadian identity in a single post, which we thought was amazing, spread like wildfire. Um, the challenge by doing something like a theme post, uh, so in October and then November, is that um, we started searching for specific material to work with in order to have a monthly or holiday theme, as opposed to just having uh, material that would speak for itself and that we could collect along the way. Um, and then another uh, theme we started to come across, or issue, sorry, a challenge uh, we were having um, in the new year, we realized is that people were referring to the archive as a picture archive. So we first we had Ohi, then we had Remembrance Day, now, oh, you're the picture archive. And uh, we were afraid that um, by doing, by just showing pictures, showcasing pictures, um, that we would be losing out on materials <coughs> and realizing that we had publicly posted and gave people this perception. So we decided to showcase an artifact and not a photo and described it to our followers. You know, that this is one of the wide range of materials that the uh, GCHP um, collects. And then of course we decided, uh, because social media um, does work in this idea of real time, um, we wanted to start transitioning from not just being a place where you find material, but being a place that would let people know, here's what's going on in our archive. Here's how we're growing, changing, progressing, collecting material, and also, hey, we exist. So we decided to do um, integrate social media real time of we're visiting an archive with letting our, uh, uh, our audience members and followers know that they too can come visit our archive. They can see the material, uh, they can experience history as well, um, but they can also um, check out and see that this is, uh, here's what we're doing. It's not just a here's a part of our collection, but here's where we're progressing as well as an archive. Um, this is a photo actually of um, the former rector of the Aristotelio uh, University in Thessaloniki, uh, Dr. Giannis Milopoulos and also Dr. Vida Kolokitia. Um, and of course, uh, our next thing is we decide to talk about the donations we were receiving um, to the archive. Uh, there's always that concept where, you know, if you let people know what you're getting, more people will want to jump on that bandwagon. So by telling them, oh, well, look at these donors, look what we're getting in terms of donations, maybe would trigger an interest in having other associations say, well, we want to be a donor as well, too, um, with that hope, but also to give credit words do that someone actually saw the value of our archive and the value of preserving their association's uh, materials as well. Uh, this led us, of course, to needing um, a logo 
and to make things a little bit more official. So in, uh, I would say in, the, in February, yes, February we uh, launched our, <laughs> we launched our logo, uh, decided to find that nice little balance between those who arrived um, via boat and also airplane, uh, bringing the modern and the, the old together. Um, and of course, um, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that uh, when I first launched the Facebook page on September 1st, 2013, uh, I right away, within an hour, received a message from uh, a contact, uh, they're actually a volunteer, they're a committee member um, that sits on the Greek Independence Day Gala uh, at the Greek community of Toronto. Uh, she contacted me saying how she was quite impressed with the fact that this actually existed and was very interested in meeting with uh, the co-founders. We actually met in uh, late October and from our first meeting uh, grew many more meetings and discussions about the Greek Canadian History Project curating a photo exhibition at uh, the Greek community of Toronto's uh, in the Greek Independence Day Gala um, that took place actually on March 22nd. So it's interesting how social media not only gave people information about an archive, but it led us to our very first uh, photo exhibit that we had in March. And it gave us uh, the attention and spotlight that uh, we needed in order to start new conversations uh, or continue other existing conversations about people possibly donating material to our archive. Here are a few uh, photos. Uh, Chris will be talking a lot about these photos that we featured at the gala uh, just after I'm quickly done. And uh, Chris did give a speech at this uh, gala, a very moving speech, where he did announce that the Greek community in Toronto was donating 105 documents to commemorate 105 years of their existence. Um, all this uh, stuff is also featured on our blog. Uh, we do have an online um, platform as well that's not on Facebook. Uh, that people can visit. Uh, I'm not talking much about it today, but I will talk about it um, and where we see our project going in terms of the online world. And then this also led us down the road um, to uh, our exhibit. But before we had our exhibit, I decided to give the theme post uh, one more shot. Uh, there's a photo that Chris will show you. Um, it's an Anastasi photo, um, Easter, when they, everyone has received the light. And that photo, we, we posted it for Easter. And that photo just, that's where our engagement completely grew. Uh, people were talking about their experience and remembering, you know, receiving the light and sitting on the, the subway in the metro station and trying to make sure it doesn't burn out. Uh, talking about having kulurakia in their pocket or their dad giving them one or their mom having salt and pepper shakers um, with them at Anastasi and the eggs as well. So the, the comments and feedbacks and interaction and engagement that occurred from such a post uh, showed us that we had further, we had gone far enough online that we were now able to create that engagement with whether it was themed post or something that they can reflect on in terms of memory. Um, and then, of course, in May, we had the pleasure of um, having uh, an exhibit ourselves. Um, we teamed up uh, with, a, with uh, uh, Mr. Muratidis, um, who had about over 200 uh, documents um, to collaborate with us and put on display uh, at Toronto City Hall and the rotunda of Toronto uh, City Hall. Uh, we had over 200 people show up to the opening reception with another 200 people uh, visit us uh, during the week. Um, here are some of photos from that event as well. Uh, the collection um, itself uh, was very, um, it, it captured, you know, over 150 years of uh, Greek history in Toronto, um, which was amazing. And of course, um, the attention it started to receive, um, we had various politicians, uh, the deputy mayor visit, um, and of course, the articles that were written about the exhibit uh, itself uh, started to gain us a lot more attention as well. So back to that, you know, real-time posting mixed in with you can come check out this exhibit of historical uh, documents. And then, of course, um, it led us to um, our visit in, in July. We had. Uh, ten students and one professor visit from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki were visiting York University um, through the Office of York International. And Marilyn and I set up um, both a lecture by Chris about Greek immigrants um, in Toronto and in Canada, rather, 
and Chris gave uh, a wonderful lecture and all the students who had never really learned about Greek diaspora history or um, especially in Canada were very moved um, by this information we were learning and we actually set up an archive tour for them. Many of them have never put on um, white gloves and been into an archive so the experience itself was you know mind-blowing and emotionally moving uh, for them and it brought the traditional classroom space uh, to public history space um, when it came to learning about Greek immigrants and it showed an interest um, in diaspora history and this transatlantic interest had been created um, with the GCHP as well. Um, one other point about this summer school is that it, it really brought this experience to life that what we've been trying to get others in Toronto to experience and do, you know, it happened to a group of 10 Greek students and one Greek professor from Greece. And I, I think that's also inspired other people um, an interest to, they would like to come visit now, they would like to be part of it, they want to spread the word about the Greek Canadian History Project. So this leads us to, you know, where do we go from here? So how can we constantly, we, how can we, um, via social media, help expand our dialogue uh, with the public in terms of our mission and interest? Um, a few points, you know, uh, creating new posts um, that we can inform, uh, the, people of the changing history of Greek immigrants, but also the evolving um, interest from Greeks in Greece as well. Um, and also talking about um, the new documents we are receiving, the collections, uh, more exhibits, uh, changing our website. Uh, we do have a website, it is more of a blog uh, format, but having that include the documents, um, linking it closer to our social media page, uh, and also I want to include that um, we need to make it a space um, where the immigrant story is told, however, not in, um, sorry, I lost my point, <laughs> but not in so much of a traditional form, um, and having this immigrant story told um, and how it changes through social media, through a, a website um, that people can go on and they can connect with it as well. Um, again, it's, it's still a process, we're still learning a lot, but we're also still uh, finding it as a way of, you know, I, I mentioned it to Jonathan back in the summer, oh, there's this, you know, Greek Canadian History Project archive, and he goes, I think I already like them on Facebook, and so he checks on there, and he's like, oh, I do, I do follow them. So it's, it's finding that, you know, you have the name, you have followed them, but now you recognize the material, you recognize what they do, and you want to be involved, whether it's through following and reading and, and having that knowledge, or letting someone know that they can donate their material or collection there. And now I'm going to move it to, on to Chris, who is actually going to be talking about um, a lot of the collection of materials. So, uh, I'm going to go through a tiny piece of one collection that we have, and this is from the Toronto Telegram. The Toronto Telegram was a Toronto newspaper that went out of business in the early, uh, excuse me, mid-1970s, and they donated their photo archive to York University, and we've been able to uh, pluck out the photos that are related to the Greek immigrant experience and have them be a part of the Greek Canadian History Project. The photo that you see here is from 1955, and it is a representation of the family reunification program that was spearheaded by the Canadian Red Cross Society, and which helped transport a very small number of children who had been part of the Pedomazoma, or the gathering of the children, uh, during Greece's Civil War. Um, to the, uh, so they've been um, transported to Canada, and here you see a meeting of the families at Toronto's Moulton Airport, which has now become Toronto Pearson International Airport. And so while the children uh, had lived, had spent a portion of their life behind the Iron Curtain, um, eventually they were brought to Toronto and this started, uh, this family reunification program had started with the plight of one family. And that was uh, Mr. Ligopoulos who in 1951 went to his lawyer to deal with the estate of his dead brother. 
And while he was there, this difficult situation of his um, children missing, uh, I won't use the word kidnapped, there's a huge historical uh, debate on this term. So, pardon me? Yeah, there's a big uh, historical debate. So, um, in 1951, he went and uh, started dealing with this. And so, his lawyer contacted the Canadian government to see what they could possibly do. And given the Cold War context at the time, the Canadian government was very reluctant to get involved. So the Red Cross Society of Canada used its uh, diplomatic power in order to bring the children from uh, various Iron Curtain countries, including Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and uh, bring them to, be re uh, to Toronto to be reunited with their families. So in this photo here, uh, you, s you can't see the media, but this was part of a media storm that was uh, capturing this very emotional moment here where uh, the families are reunited after many years of uh, not having seen one another. And so in the uh, photo paper, or excuse me, in the newspapers that surround this event, it's very much celebratory of Canada's role in this effort, and it's, it is reflective, as, as I said, of Cold War politics. And so uh, as the children were coming here, it kind of, uh, kind of hiding Canada's role and said that uh, these children are coming to, to freedom and um, they're escaping the kind of evil uh, communist uh, state. <coughs> so this photo here is of King Constantine in Toronto's harbour. Uh, this was part, his first stop of a, a visit to Toronto and Montreal during Canada's centennial uh, year. So he was actually headed to Montreal for uh, to visit the uh, Greek display at Expo 67 in early September of that year. And so before he went there, he actually stayed in Toronto because there was a regatta happening in Lake Ontario and sailing was his favorite sport. So while he was staying in Toronto, visiting members of the Greek community, uh, he was here at Toronto uh, spending some time sailing. This photo from August 20, uh, August 28, 1967, depicts a procession that was targeted at King Constantine. And as you can see, signs in the background uh, are calling to free political prisoners in Greece and are trying to compel the international community to refrain from recognizing the dictatorship uh, as a legitimate government. So leading the crowd is a young woman dressed in ancient garb here. <coughs> this is Philip Tsarnas. Uh, it's the daughter of Philip Tsarnas. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, in Greece. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nick Skoulas eventually became an MP. Nick Skoulas, he yeah. became a minister of Turkey. Right. right. I'll actually use this here. Uh, so, um, as you can see, Greece is written across her chest, and her hands are unchanged, which is uh, symbolically connoting yeah. the stifling of Greece's uh, free and, and intellectual and, and democratic past. So. While King Constantine was in Toronto, the community there was embroiled in a polarized and heated controversy. And there are numerous uh, newspaper and also uh, other types of sources that talk about police getting involved and having to um, allay the uh, tensions that were happening outside of King Constantine's hotel. Uh, police had this, uh, on some evenings, police had to blare their sirens in order to uh, kind of dim the chanting that was happening uh, outside of this hotel. So here we see the anti-dictatorship sentiment manifesting itself in uh, another uh, public spectacle. Uh, there were other forms of uh, anti-dictatorship struggle as well in the forms of meetings and demonstrations. Uh, this is one, uh, I'm showing it because it's in front of a very symbolic institution that's emblematic of uh, local and international power. And here in the back is Ontario's Legislative Assembly. And so uh, this group of uh, Greeks and non Greeks is marching down University Avenue here, trying to call attention to uh, the dictatorship and trying to compel its own government and its own people uh, of the, excuse me, it's trying to inform uh, its own government and uh, its own uh, people, Canadian compatriots, of the situation in Greece. So uh, another aspect of this form of public spectacle was the very strong symbolism that was used. And here you see the 
uh, a replacement of the uh, traditional cross here on the Greek flag with the Nazi swastika, which was meant to liken the current uh, Greek state with the uh, with, with uh, the rise of Hitler in Germany. Um, so this was uh, the, the type of um, this was the type of presentation that uh, Greeks often took in order to uh, educate their uh, fellow Canadians of what was happening in Greece. So uh, at the same time that this was happening, uh, newspapers in Canada started to take on to take their own stance against uh, against the dictatorship in Greece. And so I found many accounts where uh, Canadian newspapers are talking about uh, the Greek government banning long hair for boys and how the association of long hair with morality is um, completely, it, it's morally indefensible. And so the Canadian society and, and the media is taking a stance against uh, the, the dictatorship. Pan-Hellenic Liberation Movement also had a stint in Canada from 1969 to 1974. Andres Papandreou uh, had uh, taken a post in the Economics Department at York University. And so before he took his uh, post at York University, he visited Toronto to deliver a speech. And this is from uh, April 7, 1968, and it's at Varsity Stadium. So the event attracted an estimated 6,000 people, most of whom were Greek. And the speech was trying to call attention to the injustices occurring in Greece after the rise of the Hunda. And so Papa Andreou, at this speech here, promised to lead an army back to Greece to overthrow the authoritarian regime. So his speech was not anti-Canadian, uh, but it was uh, very critical of uh, countries that were supporting the junta. And he stated that all, uh, all countries supporting the dictatorship were enemies of his people. And so it was uh, very largely symbolic. And um, uh, well, he was trying to speak uh, implicitly about the US here. Mm -hmm. So he, he was also speaking to the Greek community in Toronto, and he said that um, in relation to the issue happening in Greece, there was no middle ground. So either you were uh, supportive of the dictatorship, or you were an enemy of it. And this was a response to the communities. Uh, many uh, who had taken the stance that they were neutral on the subject. So uh, the commemoration of Greece's March 25th Independence Day uh, has a legacy that predates the, uh, the contemporary Greek town parade that Callie was uh, speaking about. And uh, I included this photo here, number one, because it's interesting. Um, and here you see the uh, Hellenic Adartico Ad Ad Association. And uh, this photo is from 1952. Uh, but I include this because uh, there's this myth or this idea in uh, Toronto right now that uh, the Danforth, which is where Greektown is located uh, at the moment, has historically always been uh, where Greeks have this symbolic uh, homeland or this symbolic physical cityscape uh, space. But it's, uh, it's actually not. And so the first uh, parade to take place on the Danforth was in 1978. And this is uh, taking place on Queen Street. And so the old route was from St. George's Greek Orthodox Church on Bond Street. Uh, and it would go through the downtown core to Toronto City Hall. This was the end point here. And this photo from 1952 is part of the commemorative uh, celebration that exists up until today. And so here we see the mayor of Toronto, as well as a Greek consular official laying a wreath uh, at the end of the parade route. And so there would be promotions sent out to the Greek, Greek and Canadian community. And so this one here uh, was started at 12.45 p.m. at St. George's Greek Orthodox Church and traveled across Queen, as I said, and ended up uh, here. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, a local Greek association of Castoria at the end point of the March 25th parade again. And so uh, I chose this photo here uh, to show to you because the local Greek uh, association 
has been a hugely important mediating tool for Greeks as they have engaged in the process of migration. And so they've been hugely prolific, especially following the 1965 to 1975 immigration boom in Canada. And so uh, if you've ever seen a parade or been to a parade in Toronto, you'll see that uh, this is uh, almost a, a, something, a universal site almost because uh, one association <coughs> is uh, led uh, by another. And so it's not uncommon for Torontonians to relate their own personal identity to multiculturalism. And so this photo, which is actually our banner for our Facebook page, uh, speaks to that. And so in the development stages of official multicultural policy in Canada, displays of ethnic identity were publicly celebrated for their contribution to the country's mosaic and for the ability of Canadian life to allow immigrants to retain their cultural heritage. So the intersection between uh, newly emerging Canadian values and Greek immigrants' desire to retain their traditions is captured by this photo here, where we see a juxtaposition of old meeting the new. So we see uh, popular uh, Greek music and popular Greek dancing being performed here on a Toronto uh, cityscape where modern skyscrapers uh, decorate the background. This photo is from March 31st, 1941, and it's uh, very representative of Canadian society during the time of war. And so we see here, this, um, we see militaristic tones, and this uh, appeared in the Toronto Telegram. And so it's showing immigrants and uh, in the context of their contribution and their support for the war effort uh, during World War II. So if we're talking about the Greek immigrant experience, one of the most important things that we need to talk about is the church, because this was one of the first things that uh, Greek immigrants brought with them. Now, uh, spirituality and religiosity is uh, a different conversation. Uh, when, when I uh, am talking about the church, uh, the church was brought over uh, mainly as, a, as an institution of familiarity, and uh, a place where um, culture, language, uh, family, and other things closely associated, uh, cl closely associated with the immigrants' uh, sendings, where they were coming from, from their homelands. And uh, so the, uh, the church was a, uh, one of the first places that um, helped immigrants to uh, bring this along with them. And so this photo from Varsity Stadium is dated April 25th, 1960, and it shows a crowd in a darkened Varsity, uh, varsity Stadium uh, for a Greek Orthodox Good Friday service. Now this is one of, uh, this is the photo that Callie was speaking about earlier that had a huge following on our Facebook page, and it's from April 14th, 1969, and it shows parishioners at ice level and in the stands of Toronto's very iconic Maple Leaf Gardens. And so all the lights had been shut off at this point, and they uh, lit the stadium with the candles. And so um, there's, there's obviously thousands of people in there. And uh, this is, I think, a very appropriate <coughs> representation of the collision between Canadian life and, and Greek life in the city of Toronto. So this photo is dated September 18th. 1967, it was taken at Toronto's harbour, uh, near the CNE grandstand, where a male swimmer is kissing the hand, uh, kissing the ring of a Greek Orthodox priest, and is participating in the Greek Orthodox recovery of the cross. Uh, this has been popularized in Florida in January. Unfortunately, in Toronto, it's way too cold and icy to do it in January, so this is part of the uh, September uh, festivities. Uh, this is my favorite photo of the collection here, and this is uh, of a Greek school from 1955, uh, March 25th, 1955. Um, the teacher that you see here is Miss Irene, but in Dezas. The first school, the first Greek school in Toronto was opened in 1921. It was a day school split between uh, Greek and English, 
Uh, we don't know a lot about it because it didn't have a long life, but the uh, it was part of the uh, opening of the very first church on uh, Jarvis, 117 Jarvis Street in uh, Toronto. So in 1937, the Greeks of the city organized to buy a, an abandoned Jewish synagogue that they reconverted into a Greek Orthodox church. And so then they set up the uh, Greek Orthodox Greek, um, Greek Orthodox school, and it was a Greek Orthodox school because it was run by the church, of course. So um, I want to uh, call your attention to the writing on the board here. So the sentiment on the on the board is deeply patriotic towards Canada. So the image is very reflective, as I mentioned in a previous photo, of the 1950s Cold War, and also I would argue Anglo-centric Canada which was less accepting of diversity and, uh, and far less in favor of immigrants' um, integration. So uh, they were far more in favor of assimilation, uh, I would say, uh, into mainstream culture. And so the photo is illuminating of how Greek immigrants in Canada have adapted and navigated their way through uh, different time periods uh, of acceptance in Canadian society, but yet still trying to maintain some element of their cultural and linguistic past. So there's also been various uh, pseudo-cultural events, I guess you could call. Uh, this is the Miss Greek Community pageant, um, and the photo is from February 22nd, 1965. Um, I think that this one kind of speaks for itself. Okay. So just a couple more photos, bear with me here. So. Uh, Another important organization was uh, AHEPA. AHEPA was founded in Georgia in 1922 as a response to the uh, hatred and the uh, hunting of Greeks, essentially, in uh, the American South. And so AHEPA's mission was to show that through um, a readaptation and a um, public dissemination of its past, that Greeks were actually closely tied to American values. And so this organization made its way into Toronto in October of 1928. And so here we see Ahepa making uh, a public presence. This is Toronto Mayor Gibbons, and he's handing a torch to the uh, Ahepa athlete here. Um, this photo is from August 20th, uh, 1964. And so again, as I mentioned before, I'm going to show this one and the last photo together. Okay, so athletics uh, has been uh, particularly in the post-World War II period, it's been a very important uh, mediating part of the immigrant experience. And so this is often how uh, immigrants play out their homeland uh, affiliations, politics, and so here you see an advertisement for Ed's Warehouse uh, at an Olympia Coast game. And you see that the gentlemen here are wearing the famous red and white stripes. And here the uh, fans have uh, uh, flooded the field after the game to congratulate their hero on a well-played match. So uh, this was a very quick overview of, a, as I said, a small section of our uh, collection that we have. We have many more things that speak to many more aspects of the Greek immigrant experience. Uh, unfortunately, we only have a small amount of time to show you these things, but uh, if you'd uh, be inclined to follow us on our Facebook page and on our blog, uh, we constantly have updates. We're going to be uh, making a formal announcement and sharing some of the collection that Mr. Papadatos has given us, which is uh, probably the most interesting that, that we've received so far. And so, uh, this is the work that we've been, we've been doing, and I hope this was uh, informative, informative, <coughs> excuse me, informative and illuminating for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chris, Kelly, and, and Saki. Um, broad ranging, many things, um, uh, archives, uh, issues of uh, study of history. Certainly there must be some questions, comments. Um, 
for this Paratisis, Paratisis, Scolia, Alave. So, Michael, first of all, congratulations. This is what you're doing. Now, in terms of physical space, the archives, are they part of the university archives or do you have them in a separate space? And how, who curates them? Who's there? Go ahead, Okay, okay so uh, we partnered with the Clarentonist Special Collection, the York University. It's an existing archive. And so it's the university archive, and we simply take our collections to them. They use their staff and their resources to do all of the appropriate cataloging. And uh, there is a very safe space that uh, very few know about, and so we don't even know where that is on campus. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm not joking on that. And, um, so everything is kept there. So if you want to see the collection, you would go to the official archive space. You fill out a request form, and it's brought up uh, at some point during the day. And then you can do your work there. Uh, everything is, is as if you had gone to any other archive uh, in the country. Thank you. Can I add, may I add that the, the digitization process that has already started breaks down this barrier and this need for physical space. Uh, as far as dissemination is, is concerned. And this is, I think, the great um, advantage of, of having a university library archive. I was thinking more in terms of conservation and preservation of the actual materials, not yeah. dissemination. Yeah, uh, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. It's very important because the, it's, the university libraries uh, don't run out of money, most, <laughs> most likely. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, can I talk in Greek? Uh, 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 during this time, I'm going to speak in English. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, during this time, the Canadian state did not fund ethnic schools. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, not seen as preferred for immigrants to retain their culture. Um, the, the, the day asked that immigrant, excuse me, the period of the time asked that immigrants assimilate to Anglo culture. And so this was something that would be funded by the community, probably prominent business leaders in the community, or the parents sending their children to the school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I to the school in Toronto, idiots. Η ελληνική κοινότητα του Τωρόντο με τι εκκλησίε είχε τα λεγόμενα σχολεία τη κοινότητα. Στα οποία διδάσκανε διάφοροι φοιτητέ, όχι απαραίτητα αυτό που λέμε στα αγγλικά qualified. Mm -hmm. Απλώ είχαν βγάλει ένα γυμνάσιο. Mm -hmm. Μέχρι το 1972-73, λίγο που πέσει η κούτα, στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τωρόντο και στο Γιώργο δεν υπήρχε κανένα ίχνο από νεολικέ σπουδέ. Οπότε μαζευτήκαμε καμιά δεκαριά άτομα. Μαζέψαμε 7.000 υπογραφέ, πήγαμε στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τόρου και είπαμε: Θέλουμε να φτιάξουμε ένα πρόγραμμα νεολικών σπουδών. Μα λέει: Γιατί όχι. Ξεκίνησε λένε από εκεί. Ο πρώτο που δίδαξε ελληνικά στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τόρου ήταν ο καθηγητή Γιώργο Δανίλη. Ο οποίο είναι η νηψιά του. Έχει πεθάνει εδώ και κάτι χρόνια. Είναι η νηψιά του, κύριε. Θέλω πολύ να γνωρίζω. Με βοηθό τον Γιώργο τον Κυρκόπλο. Αν δεν με απαντάει μνήμη μου. Μετά ανέλαβα εγώ το 79 στο Σκάρμπορο. Στο άλλο κάμπο του Πανεπιστημίου mm -hmm. και συνέχισε αυτή την προσπάθεια μέχρι το 1984 που βγήκε στην Ελλάδα. Τώρα συνεχίζουν τα παιδιά στο Γιώργο. Είναι ο Μιχάλη Οπιτόπουλο και βλέπετε και τα υπόλοιπα. Mm -hmm. Αυτά έτσι πληροφοριακά. Ευχαριστώ, ευχαριστώ Υπότιτλοι AUTHORWAVE 
uh, individuals who have become involved and who have contributed material. But there's obviously, you know, a community in many parts of Canada, and I think it would be just so important if a number of universities got involved and eventually brought all this together into one archive, because there are Greeks all over Canada. Okay, <laughs> so thank you for asking that question. Uh, I'm going to call attention to one point that you said at the end of the point, though, in uh, getting everything together in one archive. In a digital platform, I think that that would work well. We have been contacted. Uh, I've received emails from Edmonton, Vancouver, Calgary, several from Montreal, and one a little while ago from Halifax. Now, the reason why I haven't gone forward with uh, getting these collections is two reasons. Number one, uh, I'm still writing my dissertation, and I'm still writing my dissertation, and uh, that creates a whole set of new obstacles for me. Secondly, I don't think that it is correct for us to take materials that have been created in one place of Canada, house them in Toronto, mm -hmm. and then ask students, in the, because this is not specifically for PhD uh, sure. students or for professors, um, so take stuff that has been created in one part of the country and then house it in Toronto. I think that that's going to create um, antagonistic sentiment towards Toronto, yeah. which already exists across Canada, oh. uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in the great communities. Okay? And so I don't feel comfortable with that. And so I think that the only logical uh, thing to do here would be to partner with other universities uh, or some sort of reputable archive institution in these cities and house them there under a banner of Greek Canadian History Project. And Montreal, uh, as if you're from Montreal, yes, right? I am. Okay, so uh, Montreal is the, when people say the Greeks of Canada, the Greeks this and the Greeks that, um, that's the one example that I always bring up because they have a, a more nuanced history and it's different from the history that Greeks have encountered in Anglo in the Anglo North America in general uh, but in Anglo Canada specifically and so the relationship between the English and the French and then the incoming immigrant tides that came created a very different dynamic than anywhere else in the country and so uh, particularly with Montreal I'm very reluctant to take that history and bring it to yeah, Toronto no, I yeah I don't feel yeah. right about that but the, the linking in the, the collaboration or partnership between universities, I think that's a wonderful idea. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. There is a guy who has done a great deal of work on that. Leonidas Bordes from Montreal. Yes. Yes. And to agree. Yeah. Well, I think you've seen the future of um, uh, Greek Canadian uh, studies here. Um, this is, archives are. Um, one could say a black hole um, if you try to go for them all and they certainly are complex and have their special uh, special demands as has been pointed out but that uh, this is the, these are the building blocks of a history or many histories really and uh, we have to thank Chris who must be reminded by his advisor his dissertation must be finished this important path is that uh, for Chris's initiatives in this and also for York's picking up and working with this, the department, the university, having other people to help publicize this. So I want to thank you again. For the